Hi, welcome back to Amazing Psychology. I'm Priya Verghese and I'm glad to have you back for another class. Today again we'll be taking a look at Lifespan Psychology which is the second course in the IGNU MA syllabus, uh, MA Psychology syllabus and we are in um, Unit 1 of Block 1. So today the topic that we'll be discussing is research methodologies in lifespan psychology. I hope you enjoy today's video and if you've got friends that are doing the course with you, please bring them along. I'm sure they'll all get a benefit out of this class today. So there are a total of four research methods that are mentioned in the IGNO textbook. The first is longitudinal method, the second is cross-sectional method, the third is sequential method and the fourth is time lag method. Now this question is quite important because I have gone through previous question papers for about seven years and the research methods question has come twice as a 10 mark question and two more times as a six mark question. So it's quite important and it's um, um, you know beneficial if you can learn it and take down notes as well. So before we take a look at our textbook and start going through the course material. I just wanted to give you a brief introduction. Why do we use research methods? So you know that lifespan psychology spans over the entire developmental period of a person from the time they are an infant to the time that they die. And a whole lot of research is being done on behavioral changes, psychological changes and other elements that are related to development. But when you do that kind of research, there's the first step that you need to do, which is decide what kind of method you're going to use in your research study. So that is determined by the type of data that you plan to collect for your research. So this is basically an introduction into why we use research methods and why it's important. All right, so let's take a look at the different types of methodologies that are used in research. The first is the longitudinal method and we'll just quickly read what's available in the textbook before looking at some points that will give you a better idea about what it means. The first is for this, it's used for the study of developmental changes in the same group or within an individual over a period of time and the same individual is tested at different age groups. For example, if a case study is done on child behavior within the classroom. So the longitudinal method is useful in researches on developmental changes which are done within the same group or within an individual over a period of time. What this basically means is we are measuring what kind of changes in development have occurred within the same group or within only one individual but it's done over a period of time which could be six months, which could be one year, which could be ten years. It just depends on the type of research that's being done. So the individual or each member of the group is repeatedly tested over a period of time for the same factors from the beginning of the study to the end. An example of this would be how the behavior of children change as they progress through school. Now let's look at some of the benefits of the longitudinal method. The first is it helps in detailed mapping of changes and constancy in development. Now one of the biggest challenges in developmental studies is to know what characteristics change over time and what characteristics remain constant or stable. So this kind of research, longitudinal research that takes place over a range of time or a span of time helps us in mapping these changes or constancies. The second is it helps in tracking individual changes and group changes over the time. So suppose you're taking a group of people and you're doing a study on them and they fall within the same age span. You can pick out one person from that group and you'll be able to find enough information about just that one individual as well. So it helps in tracking both the individual and the group. And also it provides information on cause and effect. Now what does that mean? We all know that certain factors affect us and then accordingly we respond and our development changes. For example, if you're talking about behavioral changes, if somebody um, scolds you really harshly in school, that might impact the way that you study. So there was a cause which is the scolding 
and there was an effect which is your response to the scolding and your disinterest in studies. This is just a simple example but the effect of cause and effect can only be studied if you study the same person or group of people over a period of time. Just a one-time study will not give you that information. But longitudinal method has limits and let's take a look at those. One is they are extremely difficult to coordinate because you need the same people to study repeatedly. You cannot choose another group of people. You have to study the same group of people or the same individual throughout the span of the study. So if one person drops out of the study, the results are affected and it's extremely time consuming and expensive to manage having all these people repeatedly take the tests. Okay, so the next is the cross-sectional method in our textbook, it's on page 15. This method studies the developmental changes by testing individuals of different ages at the same time once only. The method helps to get the norms or standards of typical pattern of development for different ages. It's faster, it's cheaper than the longitudinal method. It does not lose subjects who drop out of the study since the subjects are only tested once. And an example of this is eating behaviors in five-year-olds. So let's take a look at the notes now. Let's take a look at the third type of research method, which is sequential method. It is used to overcome the drawbacks of longitudinal and cross-sectional methods. It is the best method which combines the two other research methods. People in cross-sectional samples are tested more than once and the results are analyzed to determine the differences that show up over time for the different groups of subjects. This method gives a more realistic assessment. Let's look at the notes. Okay, so we're looking at the sequential method. Again, it's used in research studies to understand the changes in development that happen. It combines both the longitudinal method and the cross-sectional method. We saw that the longitudinal method occurs over a span of time and repeated tests are done on the same group of people. Whereas in the cross-sectional method, varying groups of people are used, but the testing is only done once. That's what you see here. So when you combine both of them, you take a varied sample of people from different age groups and they are tested more than once. That's how you combine the two methods. The results are analyzed to find the differences that show up in the subjects over time. So as we talked before, Research studies into developmental changes are done to find what differences occur over time or what things stay constant over time. So this method 
combines the benefits of both the longitudinal method and the cross-sectional method. An example would be studying the mathematical ability of five-year-olds and 10-year-olds, followed by a repeat study every six months to check for changes. So unless you do regular analysis, you won't understand if there are um, increases in mathematical ability or, peop uh, or the children are suffering and are not able to cope up with the syllabus or maybe the teaching that they are given is not good. What is the factor that is affecting their mathematical ability over time is what we're studying here. The benefits is the method gives a more realistic assessment. All right, let's look at the final one, which is time lag method. Again, this is still on page 15 of your course book. This method is used for studying the development of different age groups in different years to determine the effect of historical events on behavior. The method is rarely used in developmental psychology because it takes a long time and large numbers of subjects are required and have to be the same age at the time of testing. Let's take a look at the notes. Now for the time lag method. This method is used to study the development of people within the same age group across different years in their lifetime. So let's say that we started by studying um, a group of children who were five year olds. And then we did another study on them when they were 10 year olds. Then we did another study on the same group when they were 15 year olds. And every five years we did a study on them until their old age and they died. So obviously you can understand because of the range of time involved, like the age between five and 80 when a person dies is a huge range. Sometimes the studies carry on even after the person who started the study passes away. So that's how long it takes for a time lag method study to do. And of course it depends on how long you want to do the study. But the notable fact is that it's the same group of people who are being studied across the entire span of time. So it is used to study the effect of historical events on behavior. Now in the previous class we had talked about some historical events, right? We had uh, talked about the AIDS epidemic, we had talked about the Great Depression and all of these historical events have an effect on behavior. So that is what is being studied in the time lag method. Again, it's very rarely used because it's difficult to do. Let's look at some of the drawbacks. The first is it takes a lot of time. And the second is large numbers of subjects are required who are of the same age, within the same age group. That's what makes it so difficult to manage. I hope you guys enjoyed today's session. I had a really great time teaching you all and I hope you understood all the concepts. If you have any questions, please do put it down in the comment section. And if you've got any friends who are doing the course with you, please bring them along, share the link with them so they can also get the benefit and be prepared when it becomes time for the exam. There's a subscribe button given, make sure you press it. And there's also a bell icon which will notify you every time I put out a video. So remember, this topic has come four times in the IGNO question papers. So you must learn it because there's a good chance it might come. Again, I hope you enjoyed today's video and I look forward to seeing you in the next class. Thank you so much.